Okay, so get this. Your research into sound frequencies. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Echo, resonance. You are looking at how sound can actually like influence physical objects. It's really interesting stuff, isn't it? Seeing how sound isn't just something we hear. It's like this force with real effects out there in the world. It's like straight out of a movie, you know? Like, who hasn't thought about sound making things move? And the science behind it is fascinating. Yeah. Like, that whole thing with a singer hitting a note and shattering glass. Oh, yeah. That's not just an echo. It's resonance. Right, right. It's when the sound frequency lines up perfectly with the object's natural frequency. That makes sense. And boom, intense vibrations. So then are there frequencies for, like, the human body? Could they, like, could sound impact blood flow and stuff? Now we're getting into how sound interacts with, with living things. Right. So blood itself doesn't really vibrate at one single frequency, but our organs and tissues, they do have resonant frequencies. Hmm. So in theory, outside sounds, certain frequencies could have an effect, but it's not as simple as, you know, hitting someone with a sonic boom and they explode or something. Okay, good to know. But like still, the idea that our bodies could respond to frequencies that we don't even necessarily hear is pretty wild. It is fascinating. And speaking of wild, um, you talked with ChatGPT about this, yeah. about chakra frequencies. And apparently, if you divide those frequencies by 100, they land in the infrasound range. You know, the sound waves that are too low for us to hear. Right. Could those still affect us? Well, that's where things get a little more... Uh... Speculative. We know that infrasound can cause some weird feelings, even discomfort. Yeah. But could they directly affect chakras or or specific bodily functions? Mm -hmm. That's still very much theoretical. So not quite sound healing just yet. Not quite, no, but it's definitely a cool area to think about. It's like we're at the beginning of a sci-fi novel or something where we're just starting to figure out what sound can really do. Exactly, yeah. And you even looked into specific sound frequencies to counteract things, like like fire and water yeah i mean that sounds pretty out there it does sound pretty wild it does while having a specific counter frequency to say put out a fire might be a little far-fetched right now yeah we do see sound messing with the elements in really cool ways oh yeah like what take the frequency 308 hertz research suggests that this frequency can really mess with the flame stability really yeah potentially even putting it out wow why 308 what is it about that frequency and fire that that is the million dollar question right it seems to be about how those sound waves at that specific frequency interact with the heat and the airflow in the flame mm. like finding the right beat to disrupt a dance in this case the dance of fire that's a cool way to put it yeah so does that mean we should all start blasting random frequencies at open flames i'm guessing not definitely not safety first always yeah. Especially with higher intensities. Right. We're talking about really understanding how it all works, doing controlled experiments, not just cranking up the sound system and hoping for the best. Right, right. Like we've got a ways to go before we're at that point. It's like we're always thinking of sound as, you know, separate from everything else. Right. But your research really shows how connected it all is. Yeah. Like we go from putting out fires with sound and then suddenly we're talking about a whole sphere made of frequencies. Yeah. Yeah. How do you even begin to picture that? Think of it like this. Imagine the surface of a sphere, right? Like a musical instrument. Okay. And every single point on that sphere, it's making its own unique sound, its own frequency. Mm -hmm. So we can use these harmonics of a bass frequency, like notes in a scale. Yeah. And we can give each point on that sphere its own sound coordinate. Wow. So instead of seeing a sphere, you would you'd hear it. Exactly. You got it. That's pretty wild. And you even went a step further. You're like, okay, what frequencies go to the left ear? What frequencies go to the right ear for, you know, for that binaural effect? Yeah, that's right. Like you're building a 3D sound experience. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Creating a fully balanced and immersive soundscape. Wow. So you'd hear these frequencies bouncing between your ears and it would really feel like you're surrounded by this sphere of sound. That's amazing. My head is spinning just thinking about it. Yeah. It's and, then, and then it gets even crazier because you start talking about integrating sine waves. Right. And I'm like, okay, hold on a minute. You were looking at 432 hertz, 132 hertz. Yeah. You even asked about like the area under the curve and what that could mean. Yeah, yeah. So for those of us who haven't looked at calculus in a while, what does that even mean? Okay, so picture a sine wave. Okay. It's like a visual representation of something like, say, sound pressure over time. Okay. So when we calculate the area under a section of that wave, we're measuring the total effect of that sound pressure. Fine. In that specific time frame. Okay. 
you were curious about a 10,000 amplitude, 1032 hertz wave. Yeah. Which means a much louder sound with a lot more energy. Right. Increasing the amplitude scales that area proportionally. Makes sense. But a key thing to remember. Yeah. Over a full cycle, the positives and negatives of a sine wave, they kind of cancel each other out. So it balances out. Exactly. It balances out. So it's like a seesaw almost. Yeah, exactly. Going up and down. Up and down, and it balances out. And you were trying to get to a specific number. You wanted to get to an area of 308. That's right. By adjusting how strong the wave was. Exactly. Like fine-tuning it. Precisely. Yeah. But what would that even look like in real life? Can you control those sound waves that well? Absolutely, yeah. We have yeah. tools for that. For example, something called a function generator mm -hmm. that can create a sine wave at the exact amplitude you need to get that target area. Wow, so this is getting less sci-fi and more more science fact. Yeah, exactly. This is really cool. It's amazing how it's all kind of coming together, the math, the sound, and the potential real-world applications. It all connects. And speaking of pushing boundaries, you were talking with ChatGPT, and you brought up Tesla. Oh, yeah, yeah. And his ideas about coupling electrical signals with radio waves. And you even challenged it to find the right kind of wave shapes to bridge the gap between the speed of those two things. That's right. That's a next level thinking right there. Well, Tesla was a true visionary. He was. His ideas are still inspiring today. Yeah. But the challenge he was tackling, it's a big one. The speed difference between electric signals and radio waves, it's massive. Okay. Imagine a snail racing a spaceship. Oh, wow. That's kind of the difference we're talking about. Okay. Radio waves, they move at the speed of light. Yeah. While electric signals in a conductor are much slower. So how do you even start to bridge that gap? That's where finding the right medium is crucial. Okay. We need an environment where both of those things, the electric signals and the radio waves, can move efficiently. Right. It's like laying down a special carpet okay. that stops the slower electric signals from falling behind. Gotcha. But also lets them resonate with those faster radio waves. So that they can like coexist and actually work together. Yes, exactly. Find that sweet spot where they both work. That's really cool. And that's where those different wave shapes come in. Oh. You explored sine waves, square waves, sawtooth wave. Ah. Each one's got its own its own thing, you know? Right. And you're trying to find that resonance point, that point where they connect. So you're basically trying to find the right dance move to get those electric signals and radio waves in sync. You got That's a great way to put it. It's like a cosmic dance party. Exactly. It's amazing how much goes into thinking about something as, I don't know, invisible as sound waves. Yeah, for sure. Which actually leads to another thing you looked at. Creating magnetic fields with sound frequencies. Right. Now, that one really had me wondering. It's a common idea. Yeah. You know, that sound can directly make a magnetic field. Yeah. But it's not quite right. Okay. Sound is a mechanical wave. It needs something to travel through, like air or water. Right. But magnetic fields, they're electromagnetic. They can exist even in empty space. Oh, I see. So no sonic boom magnets just yet. Okay. Good to know. But... There's something called the magnetoacoustic effect. Now, that sounds like something straight out of a movie. It's a real thing, though. Really? It describes how mechanical stress, like those vibrations from sound waves, yeah. they can actually mess with the magnetic properties of some materials. Huh. Think of a material that changes its magnetic field when you squeeze it or vibrate it. Okay. That's kind of the basic idea behind the magnetoacoustic effect. Wow. So there are materials that can, like, translate between sound waves and magnetic fields? Exactly. That's what we're talking about. That's pretty wild. It is. And to understand how it works, we got to talk about these two types of materials, oh. piezoelectric and magnetostrictive materials. Those sound like words ChatGPT would use in a rap battle. Maybe. Maybe. All right. But they're actually super important in connecting sound and magnetism. Okay. Piezoelectric materials, think of them like tiny energy converters. Okay. They generate a little electric charge when you, like, squeeze them or vibrate them. Hmm. Quartz crystals are a great example. Oh, yeah. They're used in all sorts of things. Watches, microphones. So if you hit a quartz crystal with a sound wave, it could create an electric field. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Then you've got magnetostrictive materials. Okay. These materials actually change shape. What? Yeah, they change their size in response to a magnetic field. No way. It's true. A good example is terphenol D. It gets bigger or smaller depending on the magnetic field around it. It's like a magnetic muscle flexing with the sound. That's a great way to put it. That's so cool. And the coolest part, they work both ways. What do you mean? Just like a piezoelectric material can turn mechanical energy into electrical, 
Yeah. It can also do the reverse, turn electrical energy back into vibrations. Yeah. And magnetostrictive materials, they can turn a magnetic field into a change in shape mm -hmm. or take that change in shape and turn it back into a magnetic field. So we could use piezoelectric materials to turn sound into electricity and magnetostrictive materials to mess with magnetic fields using sound. Exactly. You got it. That's incredible. And when you start mixing these materials, understanding their properties, that's when it gets really interesting. Yeah, yeah. You even talked about using them for things like energy harvesting or even space propulsion. Yeah, I mean, chat GPT really got me thinking about the possibilities. It's great to think outside the box like that. It is, it is. Yeah. We've gone from fire to spheres to Tesla to materials that can manipulate magnetic fields. It's all connected though, right? It is. It's like this hidden network in the universe. And that's what's so fascinating about exploring these topics. Absolutely. The connections are everywhere when you start looking for them. One thing that really stood out to me yeah. was this idea of low frequency sound waves, you know, like 1 to 20 hertz. Right, right. Potentially affecting the crystalline structure of blood. Yeah. You even compared it to how frequencies can change water. It's an interesting comparison. It really is. Yeah. But we got to remember, blood is way more complex than water. Yeah. Okay. Water molecules, they have pretty simple arrangement. Right. But blood, it's got cells, proteins, all sorts of stuff going on. Right, right. It's a very dynamic fluid. So frequencies can influence things like like how water molecules are bonded together. Exactly, yeah. But with blood, it's not so straightforward. Not quite, no. Okay, so blood doesn't have that rigid crystal-like structure. Right. But it's not impossible that these extremely low frequency waves, these yeah. ELF waves, ELF waves, could have subtle effects at a molecular level. It's possible, yeah. So not like rearranging the whole structure of blood, right. but maybe changing how things move and interact on a smaller scale. Exactly. Think of it less like restructuring a building, more like subtly adjusting the traffic flow inside. Okay, okay. We're talking about potential impacts on how molecules interact how proteins fold, even cellular activity. So very subtle, but potentially still important. Exactly. Very subtle, but potentially significant. Okay. It's a new frontier. Right, right. So we're still figuring out how these low frequency waves could interact with us, with our blood. We're going there. You also looked into ELF waves and water specifically. What did you find there? There's actually a lot of research happening on that right now. Really? Yeah. And it's showing that ELF fields can change a bunch of water's properties. Like what? We're talking about affecting those hydrogen bonds, the things that hold water molecules together. Okay. Even affecting molecular dynamics, how water molecules move and interact. So like giving those water molecules a little push and seeing what happens. Exactly. And these little pushes, they can even cause measurable changes in how water behaves, like its viscosity, how easily it flows. Wow. So you could make water thicker or thinner just by using sound waves. Potentially, yeah. It's like we're controlling the very essence of water with sound. That's incredible. But even with all this amazing science, I'm still drawn to those ancient mysteries we talked about earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, like the pyramids? Exactly. Yeah. You spent some time researching the Great Pyramid of Giza. I did. It's fascinating stuff. Especially that V-shaped structure underneath the subterranean chamber. Ah, yes, the subterranean chamber, a place full of mystery. It is, buried deep within the pyramid. Deep inside, yeah. What's the deal with that place? Well, it's rough, unfinished looking. Right. Almost like they just stopped working on it, uh -huh. and nobody's really sure what it was for. It's like a giant question mark underneath one of the most famous structures in the world. Exactly. So what are the main theories? What was it supposed to be? Some people think it was going to be a burial chamber for the pharaoh. Okay. But it's unfinished, and the location's a bit odd for that. Right. Others say it was symbolic, representing the underworld or the journey of the soul. Interesting. And then there are those who believe it was part of building the pyramid itself. Hold on, a construction aid? What do you mean? Imagine it being used to control the flow of water during construction. Oh, okay. The Egyptians were masters of water, and it's possible they used the chamber as part of the system to move those huge stones. That's really clever, if that's true. It would be quite the feat. But you were more interested in the sound of the chamber, right? Exactly. Not just its purpose. The acoustics, that V-shape, it just screamed resonance to me. Right. Like it was meant to amplify sound. And it was probably underwater at some point, right? Most likely, yeah. Which is even more intriguing. It is. And that's where your hypothesis comes in. Okay. You suggested that this V-shape combined with the water 
could have created this massive acoustic resonator yeah. amplifying sound up through the whole pyramid. Like a giant sonic instrument. That's the idea. It's a bold claim. It is. But when you think about how sound works, it's not totally crazy. Okay. Water conducts sound incredibly well. <laughs> and that V-shape, yeah. it's a natural amplifier. Right. Directing those sound waves upwards. And if they use the same kind of stone for both the chamber and the pyramid. Exactly. It could create a perfect path for the sound to travel. It's like a giant tuning fork. Exactly. And we can't forget how important water and sound were to the ancient Egyptians. Oh, right. Right. Water represented life, creation, the underworld, right, and sound. Sound was powerful. It could influence everything, the physical and the spiritual. So they might have designed the pyramid to use these elements, not just for practical reasons, but for symbolic reasons, too. Exactly. It makes you wonder. It really does. What sounds were they amplifying? What were they trying to do? Yeah. Were they doing rituals? Or was it something we haven't even thought of yet? It's fascinating. It's like a sonic puzzle, thousands of years old. A puzzle we're still trying to solve. And your next step, building a model of the chamber. That's right. To test how it really works with sound. The scientific method in action. Exactly. If it's good enough for the pyramids, it's good enough for my workbench, right? Right. But seriously, building a model is a great way to figure this out in a controlled way. Exactly. You got it. And you even started planning it out right down to the size and everything. We did. We did. One of the first things we talked about was the shape. Oh, right, right. Because it's a V. But should it be a sharp V? Yeah, or more of a U shape. Right. Would that be better for reflecting the sound? What about the material? You need something solid, but also easy to work with. We thought plastic would be good. Acrylic or PVC. Right. Cheap, easy to cut and shape, and you can find it anywhere. Right. Plus, it's easy to seal up, which is important for keeping the water in. Makes sense. Makes sense. For the size, we figured about 30 centimeters long, 20 centimeters wide at the top, 15 centimeters high. So it would fit on a table. Exactly. Manageable size. Right. And then narrowing down to about five centimeters at the bottom. Oh, okay. So it funnels the sound up. Exactly. Very cool. So we've got the shape, the material, the size. Yeah. What's next? Got to make sure it's watertight. Right. Of course. We don't want any sound leaking out. Right. Then we need an opening for the sound to get in. Oh, okay. And maybe another one at the top to see how the sound waves move. It's like a mini sonic lab. That's a great way to put it. What about the sound itself? A small speaker would work. Okay. We could test different tones and frequencies. See how the model reacts. Exactly. I figured we could start around 100 to 500 hertz. Okay. Those lower frequencies, they tend to resonate better in smaller structures. So we're basically reverse engineering an ancient sound machine. In a way, yeah. And then you were like, you know what would be really cool? It's that. Let's bury it in sand. We gotta go all out, right? I love it. Plus, I feel like the ancient Egyptians would approve. They were quite fond of their sand. But seriously, what does the sand do? It's more than just decoration. Okay. It actually makes the experiment more realistic. How? Well, the sand acts like another layer of reflection, boosting those resonant frequencies. Oh, interesting. And it helps dampen any vibrations that might mess with the results. So it's like giving our sonic pyramid a little hug. Exactly. It simulates those real-world conditions. Makes sense. Plus, we could experiment with different types of sand. Okay. Pack it tighter in some spot, see how it changes things. Right, so many possibilities. It's all about fine-tuning and observation. It's amazing how much we can learn by just playing with these ideas with sound and resonance. It's a journey of discovery, for sure. And speaking of journeys, we went from ancient mysteries to modern innovation when you started talking about using sound to create energy. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've talked about how sound can affect elements. Right. How it can create amazing experiences. Yeah. And maybe even hold ancient secrets. It's quite a range. But now we're talking about powering the world with sound. It's not as crazy as it sounds. Really? Think about all the sound energy around us, especially underwater. Right. The ocean. It's a symphony of sound. Yeah. Waves crashing, marine life talking. Yeah. So much energy just waiting for us to use it. So it's like this invisible energy source right there in the water. Exactly. An untapped resource. But how do we actually use it? How do we harness that energy? That's the million dollar question. In your idea, using piezoelectric materials, it's brilliant. Well, I'm just full of bright ideas. That's a good one. Remember we talked about them earlier? Those materials that can convert vibrations into electricity. Right, the tiny energy converters. Exactly. We could use them to capture those ocean sounds, those vibrations, and turn them into usable power. So like 
these big piezoelectric plates along the coastline. Exactly. Or even submerged underwater. Like a giant underwater sound farm. How much power are we talking about? Could we power a city with this? That's a great question. Right. To get an idea, imagine 20 piezoelectric plates, each one 100 meters long and 100 meters wide. Okay, that's huge. A massive amount of surface area to catch those sound waves. So what kind of power output could we get from that? Well, even with a system that big, we wouldn't be powering a whole city with today's technology. Really? Sound just doesn't have the same energy density as other sources, like solar or wind. Okay, so maybe not a city, but what about something smaller, like a coastal town or a research station? Now you're talking. For those kinds of applications, sound energy harvesting becomes much more feasible. Okay, so there's potential there. There is, definitely. Mm. And we could explore ways to make it even more efficient. Like what? We can go bigger with the plates. Instead of 100 meters, why not a kilometer long and a kilometer wide? Wow, that's huge. It is. That's 100 times more surface area catching those sound waves. Okay, so what kind of power are we talking about now? Even with those mega plates, we're still limited by the energy in the sound itself. So it wouldn't be enough for a city? Not with current technology, no. Hmm. Okay, so maybe megaplates aren't the answer. Not quite. But you had another idea, right, about microphones underwater. Ah, yes. That's right. Instead of just letting the plates collect the sound passively. Exactly. What if we use microphones to pick up the sounds and make them stronger before they even hit the plates? Exactly. It's like giving those sound waves a little boost right. before we convert them into energy. I love it. So how many microphones are we talking about and how much more energy could we get? Ah, uh, now those are the real questions. Right. Figuring out the exact energy gain from using microphones, that's where it gets complicated. Okay. We'd have to factor in how sensitive the microphones are, how much power they use to amplify the sound. Right. And how efficiently they can send those amplified sound waves mm -hmm. to the piezoelectric material. So using microphones is a cool idea, but we need to do some serious math to see if it's really possible. Exactly. There's a lot to consider. That's what makes all this so interesting. It is. Every answer seems to lead to more questions, more things to explore. That's the beauty of it. It really is. Your curiosity and your willingness to dive into these complex topics, that's what drives these conversations forward. I can't believe how much we've talked about just by like following this sound rabbit hole. It's been quite the journey. From like the basics of resonance to to sonic spheres and even harvesting energy from sound. It's amazing. It's like opening one door and then boom, a whole universe is right there. It really is. And you've been an amazing guide through this universe, explaining these really complex things in a way that just makes me want to know more. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I feel like I've been on a roller coaster, but like for my brain, you know? That's a great way to put it, yeah. All those twists and turns and thought-provoking moments. And the best part is, this is just the beginning, there's always more to explore. There is, isn't there? Every question leads to new discoveries. Speaking of questions, we kind of left that whole underwater microphone thing hanging. Oh, right, right. We know that making those ocean sounds louder could, like, supercharge the energy harvesting. Yeah. But the calculations got pretty intense. They did. They did. We could spend a whole other deep dive just on those calculations. Well, all the little details. Exactly. But sometimes it's good to step back Look at the big picture. Okay, yeah, I get it. Think outside the box a little. So let's say those microphones don't work out. What else could we do to get more energy from sound? That's where it gets really interesting. We might need to rethink the whole system. Okay. New materials, new designs. Like what? Well, we could look to nature for inspiration. Nature? What do you mean? Think about a whale's fin or how bats use echolocation. Okay. Nature is full of amazing examples of using sound efficiently. So instead of just catching sound as it is, we could build things that like mimic those natural designs. Exactly. Channel those sound waves in a smarter way. I love that. Mm. Combining what we know about sound with nature's own solutions. It's a powerful combination. It is. But before we get too carried away with our underwater sound farms, <sighs> I got to ask about that magnetic levitation thing. That was mind blowing. Ah, yes. Acoustic levitation. Using sound waves to lift things off the ground, it sounds like magic. It does sound like something out of a movie. It does, but uh, you explained how it could actually work. Well, at its core, it's about energy manipulation. Okay. Remember resonance, how the right frequency can create those strong standing waves. Yeah, like a perfectly timed jump rope, the waves just build on each other. Exactly. Now imagine 
harnessing that energy, that intense pressure. Yeah. To actually counteract gravity. Wow. That's acoustic levitation. So if you can control the sound waves, the spinning discs, the distance between them just right. You create this force field, basically. And things could actually float. That's the idea. We might not have flying cars powered by sound just yet. Not just yet. But the possibility is incredible. Who knows what we'll be able to do with sound in the future? That's the beauty of it all. The possibilities are endless. They really are. This whole deep dive has been incredible. It's given me so much to think about. I'm glad to hear that. You've shown me this whole new way of looking at the world, hearing the world. And that's what I hope to do, to open people's ears to the wonders of sound. Well, you've definitely done that for me and for everyone listening. It's been my pleasure. This has been another episode of The Deep Dive exploring the mysteries and the incredible potential of sound. And for our listeners, keep those questions coming. Keep exploring. You never know what amazing discoveries are waiting just around the corner. Thanks for joining us.